Welcome back to the Vital Strategies Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Lonergan. And in today's episode, we're joined by Brian Dahman, a real estate developer, investor, and one of our partners on the real estate side of our business. Brian talks through how he made the transition from private credit asset manager to real estate. We also discuss the real estate market and where the opportunities lie. Stay to the end to hear how real estate is not a passive investment and how to fix that. Let's dive into our conversation with Brian Dahman. Brian, thank you for joining us here today. I'm looking forward to our discussion about real estate and sort of your background and uh, the opportunities that uh, you're currently working on. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. So Brian, you're the the founder and managing partner of Altitude Capital Partners, and uh, you're in private credit uh, as an asset manager. And now you've, you've sort of made this transition to real estate development. Can you share with us a little bit of your, your background and experience there? I spent most of my career, as you mentioned, in private credit asset management, mostly in middle market, started my career in traditional banking and, and over the years um, built a middle market institutional asset manager focused on managing money on behalf of um, insurance companies, uh, institutional investors like pension funds, uh, and then retail investors. And I did that for the better part of 25 years um, and re- really focused on private credit and private equity. Mm -hmm. And over that same time period uh, in my own sort of portfolio, uh, myself and my family and brothers were really focused on, uh, in our own accounts, doing multifamily investing, whether it's ground up development or adaptive reuse or value add. A passive way uh, with other family members, we built a pretty significant portfolio of multifamily assets, mostly in the Midwest. and that was really kind of where, how the two worlds, you know, came together. I was had this day job and then I had this sort of passive uh, real estate, you know, portfolio that we built up over the tw- same 20 plus years. Yeah, cool. So wh- when did that realization come? Like, hey, this this real estate, uh, we'll call it development piece, whether it's from ground up or, or uh, just taking existing operations and making it better. Uh, when did that realization sort of settle in? You're like, hey, I think this is a better path forward. I'm going to get out of the asset management side and move into the, the real estate development side. Sure. So uh, there was really two reasons. One, um, the founders that I was working with at the previous fund had decided to sell uh, the business. And for me, having done you know my sort of day job for 25 years, realized that as that was kind of, I had a sort of a crossroads to take. Mm-hmm. And uh, it occurred to me that I enjoyed sort of the non-day job part of my life better. I got more satisfaction out of it, if you will. Just uh, mm-hmm. watching something be built is a lot more better than uh, it's better than you know, grasping you know leverage buyouts and money and things like that. You can actually see a building go up. You can't really see yeah. anyone build a company. Yep. But the other interesting thing was having spent that time managing uh, different parties' money, even on the retail side, which are you know institu- you know little mom and pop investors through their four hundred one ks and stuff. That was a big part of our business. People wanted access to real estate. And also a lot of my colleagues and people that I worked with over the years, who said, hey, I want to invest in your deals. And I was like, well, I got my own money and I, you know, I have a day job, so I can't really focus on yours. And, yep. and so when I had that moment five plus years ago, um, you know, I, it occurred to me that I had this ver- very large network of high net worth individuals, some institutions and family offices that all sort of wanted access to real estate. Mm-hmm. And you know, for better or worse, you know, we had a big pipeline and had access to real estate. So that's how Altitude Capitals w- was born. It was, you know, just this aha moment that I've been managing money my whole career. I can manage money for people that want access to real estate instead. Yeah, I love it. And uh, you, you segued nicely into, you know, we're actually working together on a, a project and, um, you know, the same thing happened on our end. You know, we were involved in uh, a number of real estate projects and, our clients see the benefits of owning real estate. They like the tax benefits and all those other pieces, but you know they didn't have the time or energy to go find the deal. Didn't even really know what a good deal looked like. Uh, just yeah. saw people making money in real estate and thought, "Hey, I want to, I want to get involved in that." And so, uh, you know, when we look at where we own real estate and where Altitude owns real estate, it's like, okay, we're in the same markets. This makes a lot yeah. of sense. Let's uh, uh, let's put together an opportunity for people to you know invest alongside of us. So. Uh, I do appreciate uh, that opportunity. So let's talk a little bit about uh, multifamily. You know, there's there's lots of ways to make money in real estate. You can make money in commercial, industrial, 
uh, as a builder, uh, lots, lots of different ways. Can you talk a little bit wa- about why you like uh, multifamily? You know, there, there's the age old, you know, sort of reason why do you like multifamily It's an inflation hedge, right? Mm-hmm. In times of rising prices, you can raise rent. In times of rising interest rates, you can raise rent. Taxes go up, you can raise rent. And the nice thing about multifamily is, you know, you have a diverse set of tenants um, that leases are changing at different times. So you're able to kind of raise rents and match uh, hedge inflation mm-hmm. uh, as things are changing in the underlying economy and, and your input costs. So that's that's the first thing, the first reason we find multifamily interesting. Yeah. The second reason is there is a shift in the United States of what home ownership means, and it's partially changing as a result of you know Gen Z and Gen uh, Y. Mm-hmm. But what is really forcing, what's really forced it over the last couple of years is home ownership has become sort of an impossible dream, yep. with interest rates where they are and construction costs where they are. It's really hard for people to um, come up with a down payment and pay an 8% mortgage rate when they could go live somewhere um, you know, that's nice or as nice or nicer than what the house they could have bought and, and in, a, in a situation where they're paying rent instead of paying down a mortgage. Yeah. And, and the um, thing that's important about that is there's been a mindset change aside from that. People don't necessarily, you know, at a certain age, until they at least start to form a household and want to have kids in school, mm-hmm. they don't necessarily want to be tied to a house. They want to, you know, live somewhere for six months, live somewhere for two years, and that's really been the change in in the underlying mindset of of American consumers. And then multifamily, you know, it's really only become I alluded to this a little bit, but you know, four years ago, the average price of a home in the United States was around two hundred thousand across the country. It's now north of four hundred thousand, yeah. and that's in four years. And so you factor that into the, to the slowdown in, in construction of new single family homes, the, the number of buyers that can't buy them. They really don't have a choice but to uh, live in an apartment and rent. That sounds worse than it is because the apartments that are available out there now, they're very high. You know, For average rent, you're getting a yoga studio, golf simulator, all kinds of stuff that you would never mm-hmm. get in your, in your starter home. Yeah. Um, and so it's a different rental experience. And on top of all of this, if you take COVID, the run up in interest rates, we're about four and a half million units short of supply in the United States. Yeah. Um, and that's right now. When rates went up to where they went up in 2023, and I'm saying, in, I'm speaking to multifamily, there was almost no permits put in place for multifamily in 2023. So if you play it ahead to 25 and 26, it takes two to three years to build these things. You know, yeah. you're going to have an even more limited supply. And that's why we feel good about you know, the continued growth in rents and the demand for multifamily. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And I think there's also something to think about when it comes to multifamily. Like if there's a recession and I need to fill a multifamily unit, if I drop the rent 10%, it fills up, right? If I've got a commercial space and there's no business to go in there, I can put the rent to zero and, and nobody's going to occupy that space. Same thing with warehouse. If, you know, there's no products to go into that space, it's like, I'm just left holding the bag. You hit on so many good points, but like it sort of shifts. If people can't afford to buy, you know, they're they're moving into uh, multifamily projects. If they're moving up in the world, you know, they're using multifamily. It just it's such a uh, flexible tool. And I one other point to the Gen Z, it's like we see this general mindset not just in their housing, but even their employment. You know, like I look back at our our parents and their jobs. Right, they would. They would go to school, get a good job, and work it for forty years, retire with a pension, and it like all worked out. Now it's like people yeah. are sticking in jobs for two or three years, and they just like the the flexibility that you know their their lives offer them. And it's like I can move houses, I can move jobs, I can move city states, you know, all of those things. So, and further your point, um, in my previous life, we made an investment in a in a furniture company that was uh, drop ship. It would go to right mm-hmm. to their houses, and they'd assemble it or whatever. And what we found through that investment is that they would buy furniture and when they would move, they would just throw it all away. Mm-hmm. It's just a different, it's a different mindset in, in how they live and, and, uh, you know, buy housing as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you touched on an important point that I want to go back to about, you know, how you got started in this, this game. You had a network of people that were interested in real estate and, and we like to make the distinction that, an individual buying a piece of real estate is not a real estate investment. It's a real estate small business, right? It takes your time and energy to manage that thing. 
If I go yep. buy the S and P 500, it's going to do whatever it does. I can come back 10 years from now and it, it'll be up, it'll be down, but my, I can't, I can't influence the value of that. Real estate's not that way. I have to be involved in, in the project. And so, uh, people don't have the time and energy to, to put into a project, right? They've got their focus on their career or their business or what have you. So can you tell me a little bit about the infrastructure that you've built at, at Altitude and how you guys manage the, the business of the real estate? Sure. So unlike some sort of pure, I guess, real estate developers, uh, which I define as folks putting deals together, um, we're a little bit different in that we built this business on the back of the portfolio that we've owned for the better part of 20 years. We're vertically integrated into, uh, given the fact that we manage our own property. So a lot of folks will put deals together, your third party property managers that don't necessarily align with the shareholders grow, uh, uh, desires to maximize rent and make uh, operations efficient. So that's the first differentiator. On development projects of certain sizes, we are our own general contractor as well. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to be at the sort of whim of someone else's uh, contract relationships or, um, you know, cost overruns and things like that, because we control all, all that ourselves. And so having owned our own portfolio a long time before we started the business uh, more than five years ago, gives us a little bit of an advantage in terms of uh, particularly when we're buying something, not building it. We know where we can pull the levers and in increase the cash flows on that business because we've got 20 years of data. Um, that shows us where expenses should be and, you know, perhaps where they're out of whack on what we're mm -hmm. buying. I love that. That's great. So we own property in the Midwest, you own property in the Midwest. Can you talk about the Midwest market compared to, let's say, you know, buying on the coast or down South? Um, sure. what your, what your thoughts are there? So I, I happen to have grown up in the Midwest. Um, but, um, what's happened over the past, I'd say five to seven years is population growth was shifting South. Uh, long before COVID happened, it just got accelerated in COVID. And for a lot of reasons, institutions and different investors were focused on what they would call the smile states, the sunshine belt. So they focus on the Southeast, they focus in, te in Texas, because that's where the population growth was going. The problem is, um, and, and for a variety of reasons, right? There's, there's growing business, there's growing um, uh, opportunities for investment. The states have positive tax rules, all kinds of good things about, about the Southeast. The problem is when every single person tells you they're buying in the same region, you can't help but wonder how are the returns going to stay high when every single person is chasing the same type of asset or type of reason, just because if all the money's flowing there, it's going to close on the assets there and they're just going to wind up producing less return. Mm -hmm. The Midwest um, has a similar dynamic in that it is positive population growth, low unemployment, Huge healthcare and government economies, um, and in many cases, short uh, housing shortages or housing situations, mm -hmm. um, and and they're just they've got those dynamics, and they just have been less focused on because institutions tend to think in groupthink and not necessarily what's best uh, where the best investments are. So, and these are smaller markets, admittedly, but mm -hmm. that doesn't change the dynamics around growth and the opportunity to provide housing there. One thing that I, I think is important is you've done about a billion dollars worth of, of transactions. And I think right now you're currently invested in 150, 160 million dollars worth of projects. So what that that tells me is you're interested in what I'll call the velocity of money. Like how how quickly can we get into a deal, increase the value, capitalize on it, and move on to the next project? Can you talk a little bit about how you uh, do that in the, the deals you're looking at? Yeah. And I'll, I'll step back just a second to provide some context of what we're focused on now. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are ground up development, which means you buy a piece of land and you build something from scratch. That's become a little bit more of a challenge, particularly in the last two years, mm -hmm. particularly since COVID with higher construction prices and the last few years, significantly higher interest prices. It's really hard to make something work. So where we focus, and, and we've done that historically, but where we've always focused alongside of that is what we call um, value add, whether it's operational, meaning we can run the building better, or we put some investment into it to get higher rents to make the units nicer, or something that we call adaptive reuse. And that means we're buying an asset, call it a office building or a hospital for way cheaper than we can build it for. And then we're converting that into to multifamily of some kind. In these instances, we're buying, in the adaptive reuse, we're buying buildings from 
existing landlords. And I should say, mm-hmm. I'll back up. We I talked about the market dynamic of everyone sort of chasing the Southeast. Mm-hmm. That's true as well when you're not in the Southeast and an asset gets marketed. So if someone's owned a building for 40 years and all of a sudden they want to put it on the market, all of a sudden 30 different investors are going to look at it and someone's going to pay the highest price and it's eventually going to drive the returns down on that. In yep. 90% of the deals that we do, we don't buy market deals. So these are relationships that we have sometimes take three, four years to cultivate. And we work directly with the landlords that own the building and in many cases have owned it for 50 years or more. Mm-hmm. Half of the rental stock in the United States is owned by mom and pop, you know, individual landlords. And those are the guys that, that we focus on. So um, to answer your question, now to bring it back, to answer your question, how long do our deals take? It varies, but on the average deal that we're focused on now, uh, we'll buy a building. It's usually cash flowing. It's not mm-hmm. distressed. It just has been in the same family for a couple of generations. They're not doing their best to advertise or collect rent or manage expenses. A lot of times they use these buildings to their own sort of ATM machines, and they don't really care about maximizing rent because sometimes they don't even have debt on them. Yeah. So many of the deals that, that we are currently invested in, um, we have 12 to 18 month turnarounds on them. So um, there's really two aspects of what we do. Rents can be just below market and there's not a lot to do to the building. So we buy the building. And we properly market the rents and we can get 25 to 30% increases in the rent in a mark-to-market scenario is what we call that. Mm-hmm. Or we take the next step beyond a mark-to-market and that's when we invest some money in each of the units. So maybe 15000 maybe 20000 But what we're usually doing in that instance is upgrading kitchens, baths, putting in laundries, dishwashers, things of that nature. And we can generally do that on a cash flowing asset um, in 12 to 18 months. We'll usually do a third, a third, a third, depending on the size of the building. But when that's done, you'll have created value because you, you know, your value is based on your rental stream. Mm-hmm. If you get a, you know, since 2019, our average increase in rent after our first turn of the rent roll is 54%, I think. And so yeah. with that increase in your rent roll, you then go back to the debt markets and say, my building was, I bought it for this. It's now worth this. Same mm-hmm. loan to value. So you might have 70% debt on your acquisition, but now you have 70% debt on a building that's worth probably 40 or 50% more. And mm-hmm. so what happens in terms of velocity of money, in many cases, the investor at the year 12 to 18 months would get a significant amount of their capital back because we've achieved value and returned it. And then it's a question of holding it for you know two to three more years, collecting some cash flows out of the rental stream, and then, and then selling it in year four. But by that time, you've gotten almost all your money back, plus some in many cases. And you know that doesn't even take into account uh, the depreciation aspect to it uh, that certain people can take advantage. I, I love that. That that makes those ROI calculations pretty tricky to do when you know you don't have any cash invested. So uh, or or they're just you know there's so many numbers long. It's like okay, that's um, that's a lot of fun. And and I think one thing that you pointed out that um, our listeners need to fully comprehend is like. I can buy a single family home and the value of that is based on what somebody will pay for it. Okay. The value of investment real estate, multifamily projects, commercial, industrial, what have you is, is cash flow based. So when I increase the net income by, I don't know, 20, 30, 40%. Now the value of my project just went up dramatically because people are buying cash flows when they look at these deals. And so, um, you can force the appreciation in a way that you just can't do it in a, a single family, you know, residential type scenario. Yeah. And so uh, that's a skill. It takes a lot of work to develop it. You got to have the right people in place. And, you know, I, we've learned over the 20 years we've been in real estate that uh, uh, we screwed some quite a few things up along the way. But now we've got into a position where we can identify an asset, almost pay market value for it based, based on the cash flow and then come in and, uh, you know, uh, force a bunch of that appreciation. So, yeah. um, so one thing I, I think would be really interesting to talk about is just conceptually, like there's a project you're working on that you got such a great deal on the land and why that works from the development perspective. So do you want to just talk through, uh, sort of the, the foundational pieces of that and what, what that deal sort of looks like just from a, because you got a, such a good deal on the land? Yeah. So, um, we, we have a deal it's in, uh, it's in a, town called Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It's about an hour from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, again, typical drivers in the market, population growth, housing shortage, 
uh, healthcare and government. The Mayo Clinic is the second largest, uh, the Mayo Health, Health Clinic system is the second largest employer there. And there's a University of Wisconsin campus uh, mm -hmm. there. So a lot of positive things. Menards uh, Home Improvement is the biggest employer. So, you know, that's a growing chain as well. So um, through a relationship that we had with uh, uh, someone locally, uh, we were able to purchase uh, infill, which means a empty piece of land right in a neighborhood. Um, and it contained 10 acres uh, and an empty hospital building. And so we bought all of that for, I think, about $625,000. And we're putting about we're putting 200 apartments there. What's been prohibitive, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about ground up development. This is a little bit of an in between because we're repositioning the hospital into apartments as well. Mm -hmm. But what makes what's made ground up development prohibitive is is interest rate costs and construction costs, and that hasn't changed for us. We're we're exposed to those just like anyone else is. But we successfully bought the land for six hundred twenty five thousand dollars on a on a significant, I think it's a uh, $30 million purchase price. I'm sorry, $30 million project cost. And so when you factor that in your price of land per door, because land in any building project is one of the biggest input costs there is. Mm -hmm. So for us to build, you know, an apartment now for $150,000 a unit and $150,000 contains the land cost, which is $3,000 a unit or more, maybe slightly more than that. A lot of times the land cost can be, you know, a third to a half of the development cost. And we, we don't have that here. So my point is we solved for a lot of other things that make this more feasible by being able to source this off market and, and um, at a very attractive price. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's fantastic. And when you talk about Eau Claire, we, we've got a multifamily project that we uh, own in Eau Claire and we have some of those institutions you were talking about coming to us, we've got the college, uh, there's a community college, there's the university coming to us saying, Hey, there's no inventory. Can we, can we just guarantee leases for you? <laughs> and so it's like, uh, like we just want to hold these for the people, uh, that are coming to school here, uh, yeah. hospital, same way. It's like, Hey, we just want to take a block of these so we can hire some people in the, the area. So yeah. I think there's like 2% vacancy rate in the city, which is effectively zero because, yeah. you know, between people yeah. moving in and out, it's, uh, it's really hard to find units. So that sounds like it's a, an awfully good deal. Okay. So Brian, can you tell us a little bit about, um, how people can come alongside you and invest in, in your deals. I know, I know you've got some limited opportunities there, but like, let's say somebody's like, Hey, I think what you're doing is really cool. Um, how does that, how does that generally work? So at any given time, we're probably working on four investments or so, um, and in different stages of investment. But, you know, if, if this sounds interesting to you, you know, we have, um, in a client investor portal that people can log into and view the deals that we have available to invest in. Um, you can reach out to me directly. We can be connected with, you know, someone here internally that can walk through each of the deals. But the, the important thing is we've got a wide range of the type of deals that we're working on. So certain people want to make certain investments in these deals. You know, we have um, deals that might only need a couple million dollars of equity. And so then we can take smaller investors at 50,000 or something like that per check. And then we've got ones that have 10 to $15 million of equity. And of course, we're open to um, smaller check sizes, but we'd like to see bigger check sizes as, as they go on. So it, it, they're all sort of similar these days, undermanaged, uh, good locations, very little uh, downside with a lot of uh, upside just due to mismanagement, lack of historical investment. And, and um, so that, that's, that's the mm -hmm. easiest yeah. the summary, summary I can give you. Cool. No, that's great. And uh, just a little bit on your track record. How many deals have you done that have lost money? Uh, zero. All right. That's good. And that's not, <laughs> that's not to apply that none of this has risk, but the <laughs> point I'm trying to make, when, when you're buying something below replacement cost in a good market um, that's cash flowing, it takes a lot of the risk out. In the spectrum of real estate, it takes the, it's like the lowest end of the spectrum uh, yeah. for the returns that we're getting. You know, we're targeting... Um, you know, mid teens returns almost two times your money um, on average. And that's sort of indicative of our track record. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, look, we've, we've done the ground up and we've done uh, the riskier end of the spectrum, but there's so much opportunity just given the generational change and what's going on with the mom and pop landlords that, you know, we've got more pipeline than we can consume for, for the long, mm -hmm. for the near and long term. 
Yeah, I love it. And we'll, we'll make sure uh, your contact information and how to get in touch with you is uh, in the show notes. We'll make sure we pass uh, that information on to, to anybody that uh, submits their, their email. And I think it's important to also point out accredited investor status. So just to, just to outline what that is. So uh, to be involved in these deals, generally it makes sense to be accredited investor, which means if you're an individual, you have $200,000 of income. Uh, or a married couple at $300,000 of income for the last two years, and you just expect that to, to keep moving forward in a net worth or a net worth of a million dollars uh, at the time of your investment. And that can't include your, your personal residence. So uh, some of those pieces matter. You know, it's like uh, we don't want somebody taking, you know, every last dollar they can scrape together and putting it into the deal. Uh, it's, it's relatively illiquid for the short term. You know, people get their money back in three or four years, like we were talking about. But uh, uh, what we don't want to have happen is, you know, somebody puts the money in, they call you in three months and say, Hey, I need my dollars back. So, uh, credit investor status is, is important piece there. Brian, anything else we need to talk about as far as, uh, the opportunities out there in the marketplace or, or what you have going on? Yeah. One thing I, I failed to mention earlier, um, I, I, I think we did, but we're in the Midwest, as I said, but we're focused on, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota. We're selective looking at Iowa and Indiana and then selectively Chicago. Chicago's a, a little bit more challenging, but because of some of the headlines, there's some really good opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, your, your goal is to find something under manageable or replacement costs um, yep. with some easy operational fixes. It doesn't really matter what the headlines are when, mm -hmm. when you go in that way. So um, I, I think, you know, we uh, we appreciate uh, your time on this. We, we see a huge opportunity here. We're uh, we're growing uh, as a firm 34 30 or 40 percent a year and i think uh with what we have in the pipeline there's plenty of opportunity for us to continue to do that yeah i love it and uh, and i think the the way this fits well with the entrepreneur is their focus is on you know building their their primary asset and that's the business and we look at uh one of the best best wealth building tools outside of the business is real estate you get the benefits of appreciation amortization forced appreciation like you were talking about you know there's tax benefits that are tremendous that you can, uh, utilize to even offset uh, in the right situations, you know, active income in the business. And so we love real estate for all of those reasons. It's, uh, I think sort of stood the test of time as far as a wealth building tool. And back to your point on Chicago, I've got a family member, um, that's been investing in, uh, we'll call it the Lincoln park area. You know, it was a really rough area at the, you yeah. know, in the late seventies, but he, he saw the growth sort of coming back out of the city and he went, okay, Hey, there's opportunity here and started picking up assets and they've been cash flowing and, uh, he's just had tremendous wealth generation over those, those years, both from cash flow and, and asset yeah. value. I remember him driving me by, it was, it was a three flat and he was like, I bought that one for 45,000. I sold it for 60. I thought I like made all of the money in the world. He was like, it just sold for 800,000. And that was like a decade yeah. ago. So it's probably worth yeah. two or 3 million bucks right now. So uh, and he was like, that, that's my one regret. And so, uh, the good news is he held on to dozens of other properties like that. So the one, the one final point I would make, and, and I meant to do this earlier, but in terms of recession, you know, there's all kinds of talk about recession there, are, there has been for 12 plus years. Um, but the, the one thing I will point out is uh, with it comes to multifamily and it comes to recession, I would say. Unlike last time, I think you recall, I mentioned the supply shortage that we have now, the four and a half unit, uh, four and a half million unit supply shortage. Yeah. We didn't have that before. And I would say that's, you know, recession aside, in my opinion, it's certainly not likely to hit residential real estate mm -hmm. because there's just no place for people to live. And we have to, we've had these negative supply shocks with COVID and interest rates that are kind of perpetuating that. So sometimes people, um, you know, we forget that the reverse was what was there in 2008, oversupply and investors that didn't have, you know, cash in it. People actually have money in these deals now and we're still short a significant amount of supply. So that's why we're pretty bullish on being able to improve this housing and bring it back into the market. Yeah, I love it. And, and I think one thing we have glossed over, but we should touch on is real estate is a fantastic inflation hedge. You know, the government printed all sorts of money during COVID and we're, we're seeing that inflation and it's like, we get inflation in the asset value. We get inflation in the the rents. But the cool thing is our mortgage debt, you know, stays level. So, uh, or actually declines as as it amortizes. So, yep. um, we we think 
you know, if the government's just going to keep printing its way out of problems, um, you know, owning more real estate is um, a fantastic way to offset that because our, our cash, you know, our dollars in the bank, uh, even if we're earning 5% on our money market, if inflation's at six, seven, eight, you know, we're, we're losing ground there. So love real estate as a inflation hedge as well. Absolutely. Good. All right. Brian, anything else before we wrap up? Nope. I think that's good. I think uh, to the extent people are interested, happy to have a conversation. Yep. Uh, even if it's just about the, the markets we're in and things like that, not necessarily a deal. Happy to do that. Sure. Fantastic. Well, appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate your partnership on the opportunities we're working on together. And uh, this is a valuable conversation for our listeners. We'll make sure all of your contact information is available. You have a great day. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Vital Strategies Podcast. If you're interested in investing in real estate, but don't want to have to figure out how to manage the property, deal with tenants, but want the cash flow and all the benefits of real estate, go to vitalstrategies.com forward slash real estate. Again, that website is vitalstrategies.com forward slash real estate. And we will make sure to get you on the email newsletter for when opportunities become available, you'll be the first to know. I want to remind you to rate and review the Vital Strategies podcast on your favorite platform. Your feedback helps us towards our goal of saving our clients and listeners over $1 billion in taxes. Those dollars are better used in your hands versus the government bureaucracy. Thank you for listening and for being a vital entrepreneur. You're vital because you are the backbone of our economy, creating opportunities for your employees and driving growth. You're vital to your family, fostering abundance, not only financially, but in all aspects of life that matter. Finally, you're vital to me because you strive to build wealth, make an impact through your business, and live a great life.